What is your full name? John Dale McKenzie. What is your job? Senior pastor at Hope Fellowship. Are you nervous? No. Why not? No reason to be. Do you plan on lying at any point during no. this interview? Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Which Hope campus is your favorite? All of them. Have you ever been accused of being too nice? Yes. Do you think you're too nice? Sometimes. Have you ever signed an autograph? Yes. <laughs> a long time ago. Last time. A long time ago. When I was in a band. <laughs> what was the name of your band? New Covenant. Did you guys have any hits? No. No, it was a cover band for Christian artists. <laughs> Do you wish you could still be in a band? Yeah. Are you a good driver? Yes. He really believes that. Right? He does. <laughs> oh, there's no question. Do you have any hidden talents? No. He's lying. That's not true. I don't, I, I don't have any ten hidden talents. They're all out there for everyone to see. Absolutely. Well, I mean, not all the time, but... <laughs> what is your favorite word? Jesus. <laughs> What's your least favorite word? No. Why? I don't like being told no. Do you like telling people no? No. Do you like watching reality TV? No. Have you ever lied about your birthday to get a free dessert? No. <laughs> Have you ever cheated on a board game? Oh, yes. Which board game? Monopoly. Do you win? Mm-hmm. Does yes. it go good? Yes. <laughs> the other players are stupid. <laughs> Have you ever had a crush on a cartoon character? No. No. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So to answer the burning question in everybody's mind, it was Minnie Mouse when he was 10 years old. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Robert. I'm the campus pastor here at the Frisco East Campus. Thank you so much for joining us. Whether you're here in person at the Frisco East Campus, at McKinney, Prosper, Frisco West, or joining, joining us online, man, thank you for making us a part of your Sunday. Hey, before we jump into it, a couple quick announcements, a couple things going on here at Hope Fellowship. Number one, VBS is just around the corner. Every year we ask if you could possibly help us out by uh, donating some of the supplies that we need. At every campus, you'll see a big board inside of their lobby. It's got little cards with supplies listed on it. If you can grab a couple of those, maybe consider buying them when you get groceries this week, dropping those back off at your campus. It would be a huge help. And if you're like me and you hate shopping, you can always go to our Amazon wish list or if you're on uh, our online campus, Amazon wish list is available for you just to be able to click to buy and have it shipped straight to us. Also, next week is a fifth Sunday in the month of April, and anytime we have a fifth Sunday in a month, it's a unity weekend for us. That means we're going to do a unity event and next Sunday, our Unity event is Cookies and Conversation. It's going to be at 3 o'clock at our McKinney campus, and it is a great time for us to get together to have some bold conversations with somebody that maybe doesn't look like us about unity in the church. Check it out, McKinney campus, 3 o'clock next week. Hey, we find ourselves in the middle of a series that we are calling Confessions. The idea behind this is pretty simple, to give some space and time to talk about some things that, that maybe are a little bit hard to talk about in church or to confess uh, to your pastor or to your friends. And we started this last week with a, a guy that we know, a good friend of ours named Toby, who talked about his struggle with mental health and anxiety. And today I'm going to be up here giving you a confession of my own. But before we do that, I, I want to kind of give you a few other confessions just to kind of warm you up. My, my first confession, number one, is I used to be a turkey farmer. Like, true story, in high school, my parents thought it would be a good idea to buy a turkey farm, and so I ran a turkey farm for four years, um, and consequently, if you ever come to my house for Thanksgiving, we eat ham. <laughs> my second confession, I'm deathly afraid of cornfields. Like, for real phobia afraid of cornfields. Not a big deal, because we live in Texas, right? 
Well, right out of college, I got a job at a church in Nebraska. The church was literally surrounded by cornfields, and every year they put a GPS on a harvester and cut this giant maze into the cornfield. People would pay to see if they could make it through the maze, but if they got lost, guess who had to go find them? Stupid Nebraska. (laughs) Next confession. I don't know if I can even be a Christian and say this, but I prefer Popeye's over Chick-fil-A. I know, it's gonna split the church, right? Now, Chick-fil-A, if you need to get 10,000 people through a single drive through line in under three minutes, Chick-fil-A wins all day, every day. But the sandwich at Popeye's, far superior. You need to try it, trust me on that one. It's funny to me how, like, we got some people that are really set on Chick-fil-A here. <laughs> But hey, I actually do have a real confession for you, but it's, it's one that um, obviously I'm stalling to get to because it's gonna take a little bit of authenticity from me. It's a little bit of me having to, to, to push aside that confident, funny guy facade um, and just kind of lean into my insecurities a little bit. And so my confession for you today is that even as your pastor, I struggle with doubt and questions and uncertainty about my faith. And I know you're looking at me right now and going, oh, awesome, you're one of our pastors. Trust me, I know this is something that I have been working through, struggling through, praying about for a long, long time. But I think if we were all honest in this room today, like if I took you into that room that John McKenzie was just in and hooked you up to that same lie detector machine and asked you about your faith asked you questions about what you believed and the struggles that you walked through, I think 80% of us would probably say, you know what, I do have questions. I do have doubts. I do, at times, have uncertainties about even what it means to follow God. You know, for me, this isn't something that just, like, popped up one day. I woke up and suddenly I, I doubt my faith. No, this is something that uh, I have a long history with, that I've struggled through most of my life. I think it started when I was young. We moved all over the country from the age of five to the age of 13. I lived in 10 different cities, and every time we moved somewhere new, I'd be in a brand new church. I went to big churches, small churches, Catholic churches, Baptist churches, Assemblies of God churches, and guess what? They don't all believe the same thing about God. And I saw good, God-loving people who had differences of opinions, and it created all these questions in me, good questions. But then I remember distinctly getting into high school and as I'm trying to to learn and own my own faith, these questions and these doubts and these insecurities beginning to grow. And I I thought, you know what, I'll just ask my youth pastor about some of these things. And one day we had our pastor speak on creation and talked about Genesis and six literal days of creation and the earth being only 6,000 years old and met with my youth pastor and I, I was just dead honest with him. I was like, I don't... I don't know that I believe that. And I thought in my mind we were just gonna have a discussion, but he actually made me feel like an idiot, like my faith was somehow broken and told me that I better get that figured out because that's the first thing in the Bible and everything else hinges on that. I actually walked away from that discussion feeling like, great, questions, doubts, uncertainties, they're not safe, I better, I better hide it and Man, it also sounds like my faith is broken. This continued to get reinforced as I got older and was working through uh, college and I knew I was heading into ministry and even into my first job and my second job as a pastor, not not here at Hope Fellowship but at other churches where I had pastors uh, that I was working for who literally made people struggling with their faith and having questions about their faith made them feel small and like their questions really didn't matter. Even heard a pastor tell someone who was walking through an absolute tragedy in their life that if they just had more faith, if they just prayed more, if they read the Bible more, if, if they had just had a little bit more faith, then that, that thing wouldn't have happened to them. And for me, it, it created this lie that got reinforced over and over and over again, and it's this simple lie that if, if you have doubts, that if you have questions, if you have uncertainties or fears, then you lack faith and you have no place in the church. And that's my story and I'd be willing to bet that many of you 
probably have a similar story. Like something has gone on in your life where maybe you did have questions or doubts and a pastor or a spiritual leader made you feel foolish for even asking them or having them. That it felt safer to just push all of that aside. Or maybe even a curveball was thrown in your, in, in your walk, in your life uh, with God and he didn't act or respond in the way that you thought he was supposed to. And so all of these doubts, all of these questions, all of these certain certainties were bubbling up and you just didn't know what to do with them. And it made you feel like your faith was broken. And so I was struggling through this for most of my adult life. And honestly, it didn't come to a head until about a decade ago. And it was shortly after being on staff here at Hope Fellowship, I became uh, the campus pastor here at the Frisco East Campus. And I don't, I don't know what John was thinking, honestly. He must have been smoking crack when he made that decision. <laughs> But for about two weeks, I was very, someone said amen to that, <laughs> Jason. <laughs> for about two weeks, I was excited about it. Everything felt right about it. And then week three hit. And then I had this, I mean, all out basically breakdown. It was just me alone at our house. We had this little house we were renting right around the corner from here. My wife, my kids were gone. I had a fire going in the fire pit outside, and I just sat there with this incredible fear because I was like, they're going to figure it out. They're going to think I'm this imposter. They're gonna, I'm going to say something dumb because it's me, and they're going to know that I doubt sometimes my faith, that I have questions and uncertainties, and what am I going to do? Like I even spiraled out of control and I thought, you know what, I'm going to get fired and the name Robert Jordan is going to be synonymous with Doubting Thomas in the Bible. And that for me was, was huge because we literally have a guy in our Bible that for thousands of years we've simply known him as Doubting Thomas. Like you don't even have to read the Bible or be a Christian to know that the biggest doubter in all of history was a guy named Thomas, right? Right? Well, I don't, I don't know what happened in that moment, whether it was God or the Chipotle that I had just finished, but I had this, like, Popeyes, I had this desire. I knew that I needed to pick up my Bible at that point, and I wanted to know that Doubting Thomas story. Like, maybe there was something I could see inside of it that would help me. And so I did. I picked it up, and I read it, and it literally began to change everything for me. And so today, I want to walk you through this Doubting Thomas story very quickly and also give you three truths about doubt, uncertainty, questions, and your faith. Let's pick it up, John chapter number uh, 20, starting in verse 24. It says, on the, uh, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. Let me set the stage for you. This is after Jesus went to the cross. He died. He was buried in a tomb. He rose again. And the writer of the book of John is telling us that uh, Jesus is appearing to different groups of people. And for whatever reason, Thomas wasn't with any of these groups as Jesus was appearing. So his friends are coming to him. The other disciples are coming to him and saying, hey, we've seen Jesus. And they told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, and here's that doubt that he is known for, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wounds on his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. All right, here it is. This is where Jesus is about to confront uh, doubting Thomas. And you know what Jesus said? He looks at him and says, I find your lack of faith disturbing. Oh, wait, sorry, I always get this mixed up. Actually, that was Darth Vader, Star Wars. <clears throat> so, so Jesus, what did he actually say? Jesus looks at Thomas and says, peace be with you. He said to Thomas, put your fingers here and look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound on my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord, my God, Thomas exclaimed. And then Jesus told him, and you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Man, I read that and I sat there in that moment and I was like, wait a minute. Where's the part where the disciples make fun of him? 
Like, where's the part where Jesus blasts him? Where's the part where they even actually label him Doubting Thomas? And I had this little epiphany. It's not there. It's not there at all. And so I started this long process of deconstructing and trying to understand really faith and what it means, what it looks like. And in the midst of these doubts that I had, these questions, these insecurities, what I'm really supposed to do with it. And I stumbled onto what three truths, honestly a lot more truths, but we're going to talk about three of them today that I think are important for us to grasp. And the first truth that I want to, to kind of talk to you about is, number one, that doubt actually doesn't mean you lack faith. Now, the idea of faith is a little bit of a slippery one sometimes. Like, sometimes it feels like it's hard to define. And I think we in the Christian church for many years have done our best to try to give an idea of what faith is. And unfortunately, though, sometimes we kind of tell you that if you have doubt, that's the opposite of faith. That faith and doubt are kind of different. But I don't think that's true, actually. You see, we've linked this idea of faith with certainty, that that faith is certainty about something. The reason I don't think that's true is because there's this book in the Bible called Hebrews where a man is trying to get uh, his own people, the Israelites, to really understand God through history and what their faith really is and looks like. And now that Jesus is here, and he even goes as far as saying, hey, let's define faith. And so Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, he does that very thing. He says it right here, Hebrews 11, verse 1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and an assurance about what we do not see. I underline the word hope in this because it's so key. When you hope for something, you're actually not sure about something. Hope means you want something to happen that you're not sure is going to happen. Like maybe you've had just an incredible quarter at work these first four, five, six months, and your boss comes to you and looks at you, and he says, Man, all your numbers are right, your sales are good, you've hit all your targets. Uh, When it comes time for raises in December, uh, you are definitely going to get a raise. You walk away from that conversation hoping you're getting a raise because we all know that in six months' times, a lot of things can change. You're having faith that you're gonna get that raise because yeah, your boss reassured you that you are gonna get that raise, but until that direct deposit hits the count with the new amount of money that you're making, you're still hoping for that thing to happen. You see, literally, the writer of the book of Hebrews is telling us that, that built into faith is actually a little bit of uncertainty. Built into faith is a little bit of doubt. So also when I was uh, growing up, I have this distinct memory in my mind about a pastor trying to kind of illustrate the idea of faith. And I get what he was trying to say. Like he, he was trying to get us to realize that we exercise faith like every day in our lives. And he had this illustration of faith. And it's just stuck with me because I've honestly thought it was just a terrible illustration of faith. And he said, every day you exercise faith when you sit in a chair. And I was like, what do you mean? I just sit in the chair and it holds me, right? He's like, no, you have faith that that chair isn't gonna collapse under your weight as you sit down. To me, that's not faith. Like that, That has nothing to do with faith. I'm a nerd, so I looked it up this week. If you're in any of our auditoriums today, you are sitting in a chair that has a weight rating of 1,200 pounds. I know I've put on a little bit of weight in the last few months, but not 1,200 pounds worth. So when I put my butt in one of those chairs, I'm certain that the 16-gauge cold rolled steel is going to hold me. That's not faith. No, faith is skydiving. I was 16 years old. I took up skydiving. I've been asked in the past, like, if I, if I was a good kid growing up, and I, for the most part, I mean, I got grounded some, like any, any normal kid, but I gave my mother constant heart attacks because I was always a daredevil. 16 years old, I take up skydiving. Uh, it's a little different nowadays. Um, 
today, like if you wanted to start skydiving, your first skydiving adventure, you have to go tandem, which means they attach you to a professional skydiver who skydives all day, every day, and you're just kind of along for the ride. When I was 16 years old and starting, this was many, many years ago, you didn't have to start that way. And so I started static line on my first skydiving adventure, which means they have a strap, a high density fabric strap that attaches to your parachute and to the airplane. And you jump out of the airplane yourself and when you get a certain distance away, it pulls your suit for you. Well, I went through a full day of training. Um, my jump master was there. It's the last thing before we get loaded up on the airplane. I'm starting to get into my parachute. I get all strapped in. He hands me the static line. And he's like, okay, we're going to go through the last little bit of it. He says, we're going to get into the airplane. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to attach that static line to the airplane. We're going to close the door. We're going to take off. We're going to get up to altitude. It's going to be really loud. Once we're up there and it's time, we're going to cut the engines on the airplane. We're going to open the door. I'm going to yell real loud, are you ready? And you're going to answer yes. And when you do that, you are going to crawl out on the wing of this airplane and hold on to the other side, the underside of this wing. And when your body is stabilized and you stop shaking like a leaf, I'm going to give you the go signal. And when I do that, you let go. Now, at that point, you are going to start falling. And what should happen is the static line, as you get a distance away from the airplane, should pull your main chute for you, and then it'll, in 10 or 15 seconds, it'll unfurl, giving you a little bit more free fall, and then you should have this big canopy over your head that you can control all the way down and have a nice, easy descent. And then he looks at me and goes, any questions? And I said, should? There's a whole lot of shoulds in that. But he walked it through with me again, and we talked through it, and he gave me these reassurances. But you know what? I still had a ton of doubt, a ton of questions, and a ton of uncertainty. But you know what faith was? It was getting into that airplane and jumping out of it. That's the picture that we're given of what faith is. It's trust despite my fears my uncertainties, and my doubts. Amen. It's trusting that jump master when he says this is going to happen. It's trusting Jesus even in the midst of going, man, I'm not sure. In fact, this point, the writer of the book of Hebrews wants to just absolute, absolutely hammer home. And so he goes on to illustrate this by giving us a list in Hebrews chapter number 11 that we kind of hold up as our heroes of faith. But it brings us also to our second truth that we need to talk about today. Number two, that doubt doesn't actually make you a bad Christian. So the writer of the book of Hebrews is telling us that faith is about hope. It's about trust. It's not necessarily about certainty. And to illustrate this, gives us that long list of people that we hold up as the superheroes of our faith. The only problem is, is have you like taken a minute and really just looked at all the names on that list? Most of them, their story involves doubt, questions, not believing in God, yelling at God. Like that's their stories. Like Abraham and Sarah, that's how the list starts. Talks about Abraham and Sarah. God appears to them, they're really, really old. Like nowadays, we talk about geriatric pregnancies being at 35 years of age. These guys are 90, and God appears to them and goes, hey, you're going to have a baby. <laughs> Bible tells us that literally Sarah laughed out loud. <laughs> Understandably, right? Well, as they're walking through this and God keeps reassuring them that this is going to happen, they doubt it so much that Sarah comes up with a plan. Sarah's like, listen, Abraham, I'm 90. Like, I don't know, dude. But my servant, she's like 20. She can have babies. So maybe this is what God meant. And Abraham, being a dude and dumb, says, good idea. <laughs> what about Moses? Another time in that list, Moses is mentioned. 
We love Moses, right? Prince of Egypt, incredible movie, one of my favorite cartoon movies, and Let My People Go. Like, it's, it's incredible, such a good movie. But man, have you really, like, listened to his story? Have you really watched his story? Like, God appears to him, calls him to this burning bush, and is talking to him out of this burning bush that isn't burning up, telling him that he's going to do signs and wonders and miracles, and that the Pharaoh is going to let his people go. And, and Moses is like, oh, I don't know, man. Like, it's a burning bush right in front of you. So much so that God is like, okay, well, like, I can do miracles. Let me show you. Throw the staff on the ground. I'm going to turn it into a snake. And he does. And still Moses is like, I I don't know, man. I I don't speak so good. Like, I stutter. Like, (laughs) surely, yeah, you can't can't deal with that, right, God? God's like, no, I think we can figure that out. (laughs) Like, all through the story of Moses, he doubts God. Even after seeing the plagues and the miracles and God doing exactly what he said he would do as they're walking through the desert to this promised land, Moses doubts God over and over and over again. Gideon. Gideon's another name that's mentioned there. We actually named our son after Gideon. Gideon's a great story. It's this big manly story about a guy who's like God's warrior and we, man, who, yeah. Except Gideon, every step of the way, doubts God and actually tests God. Literally sees God do miracles. God tells him to do the next thing, and Gideon's like, I don't know, prove it to me. Like, make, make it rain. Okay, no, never mind, make it stop raining. Okay, I still don't believe you. you do this, like, whole way doubts God. David, David's mentioned in that list. We love David. Man after God's own heart. Like, David's awesome. He, I mean, he defeats the lion and the bear and uses a slingshot to kill Goliath and chop off his head. And, like, we love David. We don't really like to talk about that David and Bathsheba thing, but David, he's just this awesome man, and he's this warrior poet. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, we have so much of his journal, of his poetry, of his songs, however you want to label them. We call them the book of Psalms for us. We love to quote the ones where it's about the sheep and laying down in green pastures. Do you know a full two-thirds of his writings, a full two-thirds of them are what are called lament psalms. That's the Bible word for complaints. He literally sits there and says, God, I don't know if you're real. God, you've promised me that I'm gonna flourish and yet my enemies are defeating me over and over and over again. God, I'm struggling at these questions and these doubts, this anxiety, and I'm not even sure you can hear me. And these and many others are held up as the heroes of our faith and the pinnacle of what it means to have faith. Why? Man, at the, at the very bottom of chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, the writer tells us it's because in the midst of their doubts and their questions, they still trusted God, which meant they had faith. You see this idea of somehow that you're a bad Christian if you have doubts in your mind or if you have questions or uncertainty, and that's not the, the, the story of scripture. In fact, this also leads us to to the third truth that I want us to talk about today. Third truth. Doubt doesn't mean that God is done with you. Doubt doesn't mean that God is done with you. I could prop up Hebrews chapter 11 again as, as a great example of this, like God still had a plan and a purpose for each and every one of these men and women despite their objections. But I think my favorite way to really illustrate this is actually found in Matthew's account. You see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all writing um, this account of what happened in Jesus' life. In a lot of ways, they, they, they line up. In a lot of areas, they actually differ. And I appreciate some of these differences. Because you got John over here where we're reading about doubting Thomas, and John has like this little brother syndrome thing going on. Like for whatever reason, he just wants to call people out Like he literally writes that he beat Peter in a foot race to Jesus' tomb. Like, ha ha, you're slow. He calls out, like literally writing down Thomas. He's like, I don't know, this this fool had doubts. But I think Matthew has a little bit of this element of realism to it. Matthew chapter number 28, as he's accounting the very end of Jesus being on earth, 
He's talking about them worshiping Jesus and him giving them purpose. And he says this, Matthew 28, and verse 16. He says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountains where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some of them doubted. Like Matthew's sitting here going, I'm just going to be honest. There was 11 of us. We went up into this mountain. We'd seen Jesus. He's risen from the dead. We were worshiping him, but we were filled with doubt. Not just Thomas. Not just one person. It was like a bunch of us. We doubted. What does Jesus do in this moment? Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus knowing full well what was going on in their mind. Like he, he knew. It wasn't like a surprise to him. It wasn't like some mystery. He wasn't confused by it. Like Jesus knew what was going on in their minds and yet looked at those 11 guys and be like, I got a purpose. I got a plan for you. I got a mission for you. And Jesus does that for each and every one of us. See, this idea that uncertainty and questions and doubt sometimes somehow means that you lack faith or that you're not a good Christian or that God can't use you. Like, that's it's not real. Like, the Bible over and over and over again emphasizes the exact opposite thing. And I think it's been so tragic that in the last hundred years, we've kind of made this idea of faith about certainty, about having the right answers all the time and never doubting. Like if I was to summarize it today and just put it on the screen for you, I'd say it like this. That faith isn't about intellectual certainty, always having the right answers, or never being plagued with doubt. But about That faith is about, though, finding trust in Jesus in the midst of your questions and your doubts and your uncertainties what it means to have faith trusting in Jesus despite all of this and and I'm I'm standing here again in a moment of authenticity with you today to tell you I still don't have it all figured out I still have questions I still have doubts I still disagree with people from time to time about what it means to, to have faith to trust in God at the end of the day I do know one thing trust in Jesus what he's done on the cross for me I trust that he rose from the grave I trust that he has a plan and purpose for each of us and so as a, as a pastor they teach you in Bible school that you know, whenever you have a sermon that the last thing you need to do is like apply it to people like give them easy steps practical steps that they can walk away with And so today, for your application and what we need to do with this, I want to make it very simple. And I'm going to take it full circle back to to Thomas and his story. Because today, I think it's very important for us to walk away and understand what our next steps are. Like, if you doubt, if you have uncertainty, if you have questions about what it means to follow Jesus or have a life of faith, I want you to realize that in that Doubting Thomas story, It's six verses long, and that's it. But in those six verses, you never see that Thomas was driven out. You you never see his friends pushing him away. You never see the disciples labeling him or making fun of him. You never see them judging him. The name Doubting Thomas wasn't even applied to him until hundreds of years later. You never see Jesus, you never see Jesus there judging him or saying negative things about him. You also don't see Thomas running away. You know, I think in my struggle with questions and 
uncertainties and doubts, the most damaging thing I did was shove it down and run away. It's not what you see from Thomas. You see him in the midst of a group of 11 people that he trusts, expressing his doubts in a healthy way, and Jesus found him. And Jesus found Thomas. And Jesus showed Thomas why he could trust him. And so today, your application, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you need to read the Bible more. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you need to pray more and just believe harder and like it's going to make it all magically go away. No, here, here's what I'm going to tell you. Number one, if we're following Thomas's example, that we need to get in community. Number two, we need to ask questions. And number three, we need to let Jesus find us. Amen. That's it. And I really want you to know that here at Hope, like we're a group of people who don't have it all figured out. This is a safe place to ask questions, to have doubts and uncertainties. I want to encourage you that if you are walking through some of that right now in your life, man, get involved here. Find a group of people that you know and you love and that you trust so that you can ask questions and express your doubts. But also, understand that the best thing that we can do is put ourselves in a place where Jesus can find us. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me today. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for who you are, God, for what you've done for each and every one of us, how you love us so much that even in the midst of our uncertainty, of our doubts, in the midst of us not having faith at all, you sent your son, Jesus, to prove your love, to show us how much you care, to provide us with that hope. And God, as we walk through life sometimes and, man, doubt, and doubt you, and doubt your love, God, help us to remember that our one job is really to trust you. To put people around us maybe that can help point us in the right direction, that can lovingly help us maybe figure out some of these questions, but most of all, to trust that you love us, that you care for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.